Greetings from the people of planet Earth. Democracy Cast from Democracy Watch News. Democracy Cast is available wherever you access your podcasts. You can also hear it at TuneIn Radio. Check out the website where you'll find links to our podcasts and blogs. DemocracyWatchNews.org. Uh, just, just to update people, we're we're talking about uh, what's the transition of music into the uh, new online environments. Uh, Mark Taylor Canfield, our editor for Press Freedom, vice president and executive director, is an accomplished uh, musician up in Seattle, which is one of the hub cities for rock and roll. Uh, I'm Dean Edwards. I'm here in Salem, Oregon. I'm the president and international coordinating editor and news anchor, and we have John Harvey, who is our chief information officer, chief correspondent, and digital and data journalist, and he's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay, but I'm really <clears throat> interested about your music. Yeah, I have a new music video released called Mother Freedom, and it's actually uh, it was actually written by David Gates, but I did a cover of it. And the footage comes from I I gave all the news agencies credit, um, but it's uh, Al Jazeera, uh, NBC News, Reuters, Sky News. A lot of times I just put music out there, you know, and it gets played on some radio stations and things, and then I have to distribute it uh, through. Reverb Nation, CD Baby, that kind of thing. Believe it or not, and I didn't know this until just recently, but there are a few completely free music distribution services. I had no idea. Um, But there's one that actually calls itself a label, and what they do is they allow you to use them to distribute your music on all of the major platforms, including iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, TikTok, all of the all of the major platforms right now, and it doesn't cost you a dime. And then if they decide that you, if they see their analytics basically tell them that you're getting a lot of downloads, then they will offer you a label deal, which means then they start to take a cut. Uh, if you sign the contract, they'll take a cut of what's coming in, and then they'll do a lot of promotion for you and help you with the sales and stuff. And that's kind of the traditional uh, rule of recording labels back in the day um, before the online revolution, the online music revolution, which is even more of an online revolution now because, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but... Artists like Ludacris are making up to $20,000 a month on nothing but live streams. Nothing but streaming, excuse me. Some of them are live streams. People are also paying per view for live streams now. So instead of going to a club, you just go online and you buy your ticket, and then you get a key to access the live stream. Um, There are organizations that have been formed that are specifically for artists, comedians, musicians, lecturers, anybody that has something that they think they can share in a video or a live stream. Um, and I can put some links to the, in the support document for that too, but it, it's just places where people go now to see content. And it's getting more and more common that you have to pay. Now, with some organizations like nonprofits like, you know, the Reporters Without Borders or, you know, um, other groups like that, they may allow, uh, they may sell you a ticket in order to be a part of the webinar or live stream, um, but then they also will post it later, not at the time, So, and you're never quite sure when they're going to do it, but they will post it later on their website as a free uh, video that you can link to. And a lot of times, 
they're using YouTube for that too. They're just immediately putting their videos on YouTube. The label that I was talking about is actually called Amuse, A-M-U-S-E. And it's actually a, a Swedish um, company, but but the Will, Will I Am, the uh, lead poseur, as they say in France, of the Black Eyed Peas, their lead singer, their front man, is a big investor in that. So that's cool to see an artist um, investing their own money back into the music. Now, this is the thing is like my plan is to pretty much invest every bit of money that I make and on downloads and other and streaming to invest right back into the project. So it's kind of a non-profit in its own way, although I'm not registered that way. It's just, I just, that's my business plan. My business plan is for in the beginning, um, instead of using all my, you know, savings and everything, selling things in order to finance uh, my music career, I want to use the music career to help bring in some money. And then that money go, just is funneled right back into it. So there are many ways that you can promote your music on Facebook, Instagram, um, all sorts of different websites, Spotify. Um, and most of the time, it costs money. So the, the idea is that these days... Um, a musician kind of needs to be DIY and I'm all for that anyway. That's always been my style. Just do it yourself if you can. I try to master my own recordings. I produce my own recordings. I record my own recordings. Now there are still people like Daryl Thorpe, nine-time Grammy Award winning producer for the Foo Fighters and Paul McCartney and all sorts of other great musicians. But he um, and folks like uh, William Hewitt are both still working in big, you know, multi-million dollar studios with the huge consoles, which is kind of old school, actually. I mean, they're still getting gigs. Um, I was talking with Daryl Thorpe on, uh, online just the other day during a, an online production session that Hewitt put together. Hewitt was uh, a member of Star 69, which is a band from the UK, but then later he also went on to produce the Ramones and Aerosmith and some other really great bands. But they were talking about the way that they record and they're still using and they're still getting paid the big bucks. Believe me, it's very, very expensive to hire these guys to produce your album. Now I've had some Grammy award winning producers approach me or the band that I was in when, when I was in the galaxy machine, Steve Zuckerman approached us. He's won m multiple Grammy awards as a producer. He liked our music. He saw us online. He saw our video. He heard us on SoundCloud or something decided to check us out. Sometimes producers actually will seek out new talent. Maybe they haven't produced that style before that kind of interests them. I know that Sir, Sir Mix-a-Lot here in Seattle um, is very well known for his rap, of course, but he actually recorded a CD with the Presidents of the United States of America, which is a very, a formerly very popular group from Seattle, and he likes to pr produce rock bands, so you never know. It, um, we also got approached by um, Mark Kramer, who's the, who was the bass player for the Butthole Surfers, believe it or not. And he obviously was in a punk band, but decided that he liked our electro uh, rock, sci-fi kind of rock, space rock that we were doing. And I think he also kind of liked the fact that we had we had go-go dancers and stuff, and it was kind of a, a big circus. My plan is to work with Jack and Dino. He produced Nirvana's first album. He lives here in Seattle. I've met him multiple times and interviewed him. He's a great guy. He's a really nice, very accessible kind of person. He's still, at the age of 70-something, still is in three or four different bands, including a, a, a revival of Sky Cries Mary, which was a very popular band in Seattle for a while. Um, so he's a very busy guy, but he did produce the Black Tones' first album, uh, Cobain and Cornbread, which is actually a reference partly to... Kurt Cobain from the grunge movement, which, you know, who Jack and Dino helped produce. So they had a connection with Nirvana themselves, and so did he. So I guess Eva Walker, the fantastic lead singer and, and guitar player for the band, her boyfriend sent Jack and Dino some tapes of the band without her knowledge, and the next thing you know, Jack had agreed to produce the band. Well, that really helps you 
uh, with your career when you have a very famous producer and somebody with a great reputation like Jack with you, um, it really does help your sales and gets attention. So if you can work with a person like that, it's definitely worth doing and it's worth you know spending the money or coming up with the money somehow to do that. But these guys still work in studios, um, although um, Daryl Thorpe said that when he recorded with Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters, it wasn't really a studio. It was just a house. He said it wasn't really a studio. It wasn't professional. It didn't have an engineering studio or anything. So sometimes bands record in very unlikely places as well. I've recorded in old churches. There's a famous story of Deep Purple in um, in Montreux, Switzerland. They were going to record in a casino that was scheduled to close down for the season. And unfortunately, when Frank Zappas and the Mothers of Invention were performing on the last show before the casino closed down, somebody burned the damn place down, as their song Smoke on the Water describes. So, But they were um, going to actually record in an abandoned uh, casino. So you can turn a space into a studio if it has good natural sound. Um, but these days, most artists are actually recording in their living room or their basement or their bedroom or their garage or something like that. And they have a very, you know, just maybe a laptop, a lot of samples, a few instruments, and a lot of software and plugins. Uh, that's the way music is being made today. And of course, you don't even need any instruments because there are plenty of samples out there that you can buy. Um, so you can sort of buy your way to uh, a music career if you want, if you have the money and you, you don't mind, you know, sampling everybody else. But there's also a lot of just traditional rock bands out there and country bands and folk bands and bluegrass bands that are just playing in the old style. And some people do like those big studios with the huge consoles. Um, but you really don't need a million-dollar studio to, to create that sound these days. And each producer has their own sense of what sounds good and what doesn't anyway. There's no template. There's no audio recording course you can take. There's no online webinar you can attend that will guarantee you success as an engineer, a sound engineer, or a producer. See, so the old days of the recording labels coming in to your show, coming to see you, sending an A and R guy or girl to check out what you're doing, and then you know giving you a huge advance, hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever that you blow on drugs and you know, and then going to the studio. Those days are over. You pretty much have to finance yourself until you get to a point where you can uh, get attention from major distributors, or you can go through these. Distributing companies, which is what I do, the CD Baby, Distro Kid, they have different ways of doing things, but they will also help you collect royalties. Um, you should be a member of ASCAP or BMI anyway, because sometimes royalties slip through, especially for live performance and things like that that you may not know about or that Distro Kid may not pick up on. Their algorithms are, are far from perfect in terms of actually getting you the royalties that you probably deserve. And then it's also, of course, pretty easy these days for people to pri pirate your music and sell it without your knowledge, especially in foreign markets. Speaking of that, China has become a huge market. They're opening their doors right now to artists from the United States for music distribution. And some people and some distribution companies are becoming, let's, let's put it this way, filthy rich, un unquote, um, off of the Asian market, especially China. TikTok has become a, a big place to put your music. Um, and you never know, there's always a new platform, and there are a lot of platforms that <clears throat> people don't know much about. Uh, but there are some major distribution companies that a lot of people use, uh, and they tend to do a pretty decent job. They're set up differently. Some of them, you have to pay a one-time fee for each song you release. Others, you have to actually pay them per month or per year. Uh, I don't prefer that way of doing things because if you're a very prolific musician and you end up releasing 20 different tracks in one year, then that means at the end of the year, you have to repay the distribution company for each one of those songs for the next 12 months. And if suddenly you just didn't pay it, they drop you from distribution immediately. Uh, with other folks like CD Baby, there's an upfront cost uh, which is not exorbitant. I mean, it, you know, it's not something that a person struggling to feed their family is going to be able to afford, but um, it is something you could save up for and do a release a year or something. 
And once you pay that one-time fee, they say you're, you're covered for a lifetime. Um, that's an issue that I haven't been able to interview any of these companies about, but I'm, I'll send a question to Ari, Ari Herstand about that because he also has worked with a lot of Grammy award-winning producers and people in the music industry and these distributors. He knows some of them personally. And uh, I trust his blog, Ari's Take, because he doesn't accept any endorsements for products or anything like that. So he's pretty honest. And even in the past when uh, they've offered, certain companies have offered to advertise on his website, he still bashed them and was very highly critical of their business practices in his blog. So I trust what he's saying. And uh, he also has Ludacris as part of his online academy where, yes, you, know, you can get a lot of free stuff from Ari's Take. That's a, just a free blog. And you can learn a whole lot about the music industry that's very helpful because he's always doing research and interviewing these people. But you can also pay him and Ludacris to teach you on, on an online course, which is kind of expensive, but some professional musicians find it helpful. Um, but there is a, a one-time fee, and then they cover uh, distribution and collecting royalties. There are other licensing and publishing deals for videos. Um, and there's also this group called Reverb Nation, which I also work with. And they, they do offer free accounts, but they also have a paid account where they send you a lot of links to potential record labels looking for new artists, online radio stations, playlists. And when people start gigging again, or when they were gigging, uh, offers to participate in concerts and music festivals around the country and sometimes around the world. So there are ways that you, you as a musician can get support. You can find technical support by developing relationships with some of these people online or personally, and you can get your music out there. And then the main thing, of course, is once you get your music out there, then... It's the old adage that it's great if you have a masterpiece you've created, but if nobody knows that it's hanging in the museum, then no one will see it. So you have to literally spend a lot of your time. It does become sort of a full-time job doing nothing but promotion, just making sure that everybody knows that you have a new release. I've just done that with my new release, Mother Freedom. You try to make sure that you're, you cover all the social networking platforms that you, you like and that all your friends know you've released it. And also, surprisingly, you have to encourage people and even your friends sometimes to share it or to subscribe maybe to your channel. Or, um, because a lot of times people just kind of forget that if you don't give them that reminder and they'll be your, a friend or a family member and they'll say, hey, I liked your video, it was great. But then they don't subscribe to your YouTube channel and so they don't know when your next release is. Uh, so... Another tip here for musicians, email lists are top. I know it's old school, and I know I've been saying that uh, I'm not an old school kind of guy when it comes to you know, building multi-million dollar studi studios when you can do it with your nice laptop, or um, I'm also not about spending a lot of money on mastering your stuff or paying a PR firm or whatever to promote you. Um, but it's also true about uh, promoting online is that you have to do it yourself. And if you want a really good response, you can use social networking platforms. But regardless of the fact that, you know, like me, you may have thousands of people that follow you on a social platform. It doesn't mean that they are going to see your post. And uh, no matter what time of day, even if you're posting it according to your analytics at the very right time of day when you're going to get your peak audience for your region of the country or whatever, or people who are interested in what you're doing, you still are not going to get everyone. So the most consistent way to get engagement is still a very extensive email list, believe it or not. Uh, I don't know musicians who are utilizing, who are doing you know, cold calls on a telephone or anything like that, but you can use texting also for people who have agreed to receive texts from you. And that can also be very helpful in directly communicating with people. But email is still the best way. And a lot of musicians bypass that because they think that, well, I have an Instagram account and I'm on Spotify and I'm on Facebook and SoundCloud and this and that. 
and so and Tumblr and Blogger and Twitter and everything. So who you know why should I have to you know talk to someone personally is basically what they're saying. Well, no, you do. You really have to reach out to every fan individually with a, an email, and ha- if they have, if they agree to give you their email, and of course, you know, don't sell it and be um, unethical about how you use their email. But if they've agreed to allow you to send them updates or links to your new releases, then definitely do it because people are much more likely to respond to an email than they are a quick post that you threw up at Instagram at two o'clock in the morning. Now, if they really like what you do and they're a big fan and they follow you a lot, they will see it. Uh, but if they're just somebody that you know you know but has never really checked out your music, they may not. And so it, it takes some time, but there's no reason that every musician shouldn't have a very extensive email list. And whenever you're communicating with people about your music, like the other day I uh, met a, a friend who I hadn't seen for years, and I said, Mackenzie, hey, um, what are you doing with your music? He said, well, he's doing what a lot of folks are. He's um, doing his own DIY music, probably using Ableton Live or something um, on his laptop. And he's also remixing other people's stuff. So uh, he's he's doing his music. He's doing it the way he wants to do it. And I said, well, you know, I just released a song. So do you do email? And of course, then he just literally like took out a piece of paper because he didn't have a business card and wrote his email on on a piece of paper. Now that goes into my list, and every once in a while you have to go back to your list and uh, purge it for people who have never responded or have moved or you're getting bounced emails. It happens to me all the time. It happens with my media list too. You might also want to come up with a list of people that you know in the media who might be interested in your music so you can let them know when your song is released so they can help promote it on their programs if they want or just because they're your friend and they enjoy it. So email, believe it or not, is the gets the highest percentage of di- of direct engagement with your audience. Um, some people don't use Facebook. Some people, a lot of people, don't use Twitter. Um, a lot of people don't use this or that. They have their own particular platform, and that's another thing that I talk about a lot too. Is that each individual listener and consumer of music also may have their own particular platform that they appreciate above all others, and maybe only use that. So if you don't have your stuff on Spotify, even if you're, you have a huge following on YouTube, they're not going to hear your stuff. And they're not going to go to YouTube just because you said it's a good idea. <laughs> they're not going to open a Facebook account because they hate Facebook, whatever. There's people who just have their own way of listening to music. Maybe they only listen to bands on SoundCloud. Maybe they only listen to music on YouTube. And the people that I talked to recently... Um, I mean, some of them only listen to music on Spotify on their phone. That's their only way of listening to music. But there are other folks, uh, there seems to be a large percentage around me who really listen to a lot of free music on SoundCloud and YouTube. So if you can get your stuff out there, even if they're not paying to download your music, even if you're not using advertising on your YouTube account to generate income, it still is a good way of getting the word out there. And my way of looking at Uh, building a music career is that the first thing you want is for people to hear your music. Whether you're making a lot of money off of it in the beginning is a totally separate issue. I mean, if you're only out to make money, there are plenty of other things you can do (laughs) that will probably have a quicker, uh, more uh, lucrative return. But if you really love your music and you think you've got talent and you can compete with the best, then you just have to build your following slowly and consistently over time and be consistent with it and once people get used to the idea that you're a good musician and they like what you're doing, then they start to come to you. But you have to sort of convince them of that. You can't just uh, throw a link at them and say, you know, be my fan. People, especially in the, the Seattle audience, where I'm like, I'm the, as far as Reverb Nation goes, which is one thing that a lot of, it's one thing that a lot of artists like to use. I don't mind it. It's good. It helps me in some ways, but it um, it creates opportunities. Let's put it that way. But I'm like a top chart guy on Reverb Nation or whatever and I only have a couple songs on there but those songs just happen to get really popular and that is a way of getting the music out there and getting my name out there. I would say to up and coming musicians um, producers, artists is just get your stuff out there and then once you get a following like suddenly your YouTube video takes off and goes viral okay now 
start to look at ways of turning that into an income stream, go ahead and allow some advertising on your YouTube channel. You can actually be very specific these days on who you allow to advertise and who you don't. You can also um, offer your songs for download at Bandcamp and other places. So then you realize that there's an income, income potential there. And sometimes you just put your music out there to get your name out there and build a reputation. And I did that with one song called Legion of Boom, which has um, got, you know, like 6,000 hits or whatever. Um, and it was right, you know, that's good to have that happen pretty quickly. Um, but I wasn't thinking about generating an income from that. Now, presumably, with, you know, 6,700 listens, I could have had people download that for a dollar a piece, you know, 99 cents a piece, and that would have been, you know, six, seven thousand dollars, but that's okay. Um, sometimes time is more important than money as well. Sometimes it's more important that you're in the studio right now doing something really good and productive that could create a good in- income stream later than worrying about, you know, what you produced last year or the year before. But it's a whole new world out there, and um, people are doing more and more online ticket sales, more and more online streaming, more and more. St- Streaming is is where the industry is, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. The question of whether the clubs and the arenas are going to open again for major concert tours has not been answered. And I remember when Pearl Jam tweeted out that they were very disappointed that they hadn't gotten uh, enough information from government health uh, officials to decide whether to hold their tour or not. And so they just immediately, they just canceled it, you know, because they didn't said they didn't have enough information. And uh, every time I've asked uh, locally people in the know, in the music industry, in the business, in the biz, as they say, wh- whether things are going to open for live music anytime soon, like the crocodile, the show box, new Mo's, n- the ne- nectar, the place that I always love to play. Um, I get no answer. So, and also you get answers just like you have with the businesses opening in in the Seattle area, which is they'll say that they're going to open and then they don't. And then six months later, they're still saying that they're going to open and they haven't. So things get pushed back. It's created an entire new uh, way of doing music. Um. And I don't know, the one thing I was going to say earlier is I don't know because I haven't been able to interview someone from, say, CD Baby or, or DistroKid, but I'll ask Ari if he can do this. I don't know whether what, what would happen if you had signed an agreement with one of these companies to license and distribute your music and collect royalties ad infinitum because you paid that lifetime fee and they go under. So always be prepared for, you know, changes in the market and changes in the way distribution is done. Nothing is totally sacrosanct. Um, So what is working for you today may not work for you tomorrow. And part of being a musician these days is just keeping up on what's happening. Now, there are musicians who just like to play in local clubs and don't really care about getting online and don't like to spend time in front of a computer. You know, there's plenty of music out there um, that has nothing to do with being online, but it's just more difficult these days to share that with people. Um, there are still buskers, believe it or not, in some parts of um, cities in the United States, and there are still people doing what they call live concerts. Um, our friend here in Seattle, Jim Page, just did a show like that. And they actually go into a local music venue and perform there but maybe there's only five or ten people there and they live stream it because it's not a physical, it's not for a physical presence performance, it's for an online performance. So that's where everything is headed. I think there are a lot of great opportunities for musicians, artists, producers these days because the software that's available, some of it as freeware, like Audacity, is better than a lot of old, um, very expensive recording studios. When the Beatles were doing their first few albums they only had four track recording studios so you could only record four instruments separately most people recorded everything live in the studio that's why you'll see pictures of 
the Rolling Stones in a studio somewhere, and it's a pretty big-sized building because they have to accommodate all those musicians. And they also have to kind of separate them a little bit with sound baffling in order to so they don't bleed through on each other's microphones when they're playing live together. But even to this day, people like William Hewitt and Daryl Thorpe uh, prefer to record bands live in the studio. That's just what they like. You don't have to do it that way. I've worked with bands where uh, it was it was a band because we would perform together on tours, but we were in the studio mainly a recording project because I would never see the other musicians in the studio while I was there. They had already laid down the bass tracks and the guitar tracks, you know, days or a week before, and then I came in to do the vocals or the keyboards or something. So I would hear their parts, but I wouldn't actually interact with them in the studio. A lot of people are recording remotely that way right now and I was able to compose a, a classical piece called the Quarantine Suite dedicated to all the first responders out there and people in the medical profession and other professions that are the front line on the front line of this pandemic and that was all done remotely with musicians from Poland and Germany who recorded their stuff separately from me uh, and then I arranged and I composed, arranged it, and and then mastered the recording after they sent me the tracks or the stems, is, is what they call uh, the basic tracks. But for folks, just quickly before I conclude here, there here are a, a few uh, free online music distri- distribution companies that are probably worth your time checking out because for very little money or no money, you can actually get your stuff distributed to all the major. Uh, platforms right now, and that's Amuse, which is the one I talked about before, which is actually also partly a label. There's another one called Sounddrop, um, and they are what I use for cover songs because there's a separate licensing a situation when you cover somebody else's song. You have to have permission from whoever owns the copyright who, uh, on that song, whether it be the artist or a label. That's another thing about recording labels, unfortunately, is that Sometimes, after they invest a lot of money into your band, they also want to own the rights to the recording, or they want to own the master tapes, and that can get into big, long legal disputes, and suddenly somebody owns your music that you don't even know. Uh, Yoko Ono sold a lot, who, basically, who actually follows me on social media, and I follow her. She sold most of the Beatles catalog at one point to Michael Jackson, so that's what can happen. Uh, suddenly the song Revolution by the Beatles is being used for a Nike commercial, that kind of thing. So you have to be careful as a journalist and as a musician. I prefer, of course, to own the rights to my own music. And if somebody wants to share an income stream and they want you know, 15%, 20%, 50% in some cases of uh, the money you're making through live stream, then they better be offering me a whole lot of uh, promotional opportunities and other things that are helping my career. Uh, it's got to be a partnership. It can't be just, oh, somebody bought my music and now I just get 50% of the of the proceeds. Some companies will split with you, and but they do it because they're actually doing a lot to help you further your career. Root Note is another free distribution service. They will take 15% of your royalties once the money starts coming in. Um, and you can also opt to pay an upfront fee and a subscription fee that allows you and your band to keep every cent you make after you've paid that upfront fee, which is probably a good idea. Um, they can, you know, you can do both. You can start by just allowing them to take 15% until you have made enough money. You can invest in your own stuff, and then you can just uh, pay a, an upfront fee and then start getting your own proceeds. Lander, L-A-N-D-R, is actually... Uh, not free, but it's incredibly cheap. Uh, you can get unlimited number of MP3 files uh, for four bucks a month. And the thing about Lander, which is nice, is they will actually master your music for you. So they are the number one online digital mastering service. Another reason not to spend thousands of dollars uh, to pay somebody in a studio somewhere to, to master your music. Uh, a quick hint, hint on that is that Daryl Thorpe said that when he produced the Foo Fighters album Concrete and and what is it called? A Gold and Concrete or Concrete and Gold. It that uh they actually had somebody else master the recordings, the 
the mix downs already. They had paid somebody else to do it and paid quite a bit of money, but Dave Grohl did not like the sound. He liked the original mixes better than the master. So that's one of the reasons they brought Daryl Thorpe in is to redo some of the mixing and try to get um, something maybe a little more raw. Maybe a, a, Sometimes uh, in sound engineers or producers do way too many overdubs, use way too much compression. They use so many tricks and effects that it, it kind of uh, kills the enthusiasm, the original energy behind the music. So it might sound great. Um, that also happened with Daryl Thorpe when he remixed some of John Lennon's stuff uh, with Yoko Ono. Uh, he sent Yoko Ono a couple of mixes. One of them he had spent, I think, nine hours on, nine hours straight. He's Daryl Thorpe is the kind of guy who just works through an entire session. He eats while he's working. He likes to keep his train of thought and keep the, the production flow going. Now, he does say that it's good to take breaks every few hours to get fresh perspective, maybe go grab a bite to eat, whatever, take a walk around the studio because you get fresh ears and fresh perspective on the music when you come back in. But in general, he'll spend a whole day on one session. So he did a quick mix of one of John's uh, older songs, and then he spent nine hours on one, and he sent them to Yoko Ono, and she liked the one that he spent about a half hour on. Because it was more authentic, I think, in her uh, mind and more what John Lennon would have done. So it's not all about studio trickery and the amount of money you spend and how fancy your software is. And in fact, a really funny thing about this talk I had with Daryl Thorpe and William Hewitt is that they both like Echoplex. And this is what started a whole conversation with me and them is that they like an Echoplex machine, which is a very old design built in the 1950s. It's a tape loop that creates an echo but it's got a classic sound, a classic analog sound. Another thing that people do is they'll take a digital recording and they'll transfer it over to an analog tape deck because they like the sound of the warm tape better. So it just depends on who you are. With John Lennon's Imagine, the sound engineer, when John wasn't around, took the master recording and played it through an echoplex with a very short delay, which created this cool kind of chorus effect. And that became, you know, a worldwide, you know, platinum selling hit or whatever. Um, and actually, it was a studio trick that nobody would have thought of doing. And, and most sound engineering schools would tell you never to do. But it just turned out great. It worked great. Um, but in terms of what was happening with uh, some of these mixes, you know, sometimes you, you, you spent too much time. I think that's why Jack and Dino likes to bring the band into the studio and record the band like they sound live on stage. Because if you're a really good live band, which is what makes a good band in a lot of times, especially a rock band um, or a jazz um, combo, if you're a good live band like the Black Tones, I mean, that's a huge part of their success is that they really get the crowds excited. They, they interact directly with the crowd from the stage during their shows. They have a really good vibe. That can be transferred into the studio and if you can keep that going, that's what, he, that's what Jack and Dino did with Nirvana's first album. He just basically brought them into the studio and had them play live and tried to capture what they sounded like on stage. And I have seen a few videos of Nirvana doing uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit at the OK Hotel, which is this tiny little club in Seattle. Uh, and they sounded great on stage, you know, even though it was a really, uh, probably an old VHS recording or S uh, it record, uh, video recording. Uh, it just you can tell that they were a really good band on stage and that they sounded good. So those are some of the tips that musicians are talking about these days and that uh, this is some of the information that you, know, you can get by paying a lot of money <laughs> by being online with some of these webinars with Grammy Award winning producers. But I've been picking their brains and sending them questions and, and just commenting sometimes on what they're doing online. And it, they tend to be very interested in what I'm saying for some reason. And so they follow up. And then I get to share that with other people, too, because um, I have a lot of admiration for people like William Hewitt, Daryl Thorpe, Jack and Dino. They're kind of my heroes. And so what they say is very important to me because they have a, a long track record of creating very vital music in our culture. Um, and I listen to a lot of the bands that they've produced. So... That's the way you get to be after a while, too, if you do a lot of production or mastering, is that when you hear a song 
no matter what device you're listening to it on, whether it's you know tiny little cell phone speakers or laptop speakers or on your nice uh, Apple earbuds or um, and, and a big PA system at a club, I'm always listening for what the mix sounds like and how they recorded it and, and trying to learn from that. It's just something you do as a musician. Whenever you hear music, you kind of, kind of analyze it in your mind and think, oh, what was, that was a Hammond B3. Oh, my gosh. Another thing I laugh at is there are a lot of software engineers that are struggling to come up with emulations of old 1950s style equipment and they have yet to really match the beauty of some of that sound. So I don't, you know, a Hammond B3 organ, that's what Keith Emerson used with Emerson Lake and Palmer. It's one of the most famous uh, organ sounds in the history of rock and roll. I got to see Keith Emerson live in concert and a solo concert stab his B3 organ with knives and kick it off the stage and do all sorts of crazy things to it. But those things are monsters and they can take a lot of damage. But they have a Leslie speaker system where the speaker itself actually spins in physical space. And that's what gives it a really interesting vibrato. And of course, you can control the speed of the spin and get a, a different kind of sound. But I, as far as I can tell, nobody has been able to emulate that with a software plug-in. Um, same thing with the Echoplex. That's why even with the top-of-the-line Pro Tools, really expensive software out there that's available to people, people like... Jack and Dino or William Hewitt or Dale Thorpe will go back into the closet and pull out that old, nice vintage piece of equipment or that old Marshall tube amp from 1962 and use that. Um, because some sounds you just cannot emulate through uh, a mathematical algorithm and synthesis. But that's, that's what it looks like from the music industry today, folks. This is Mark Taylor Canfield musician and journalist, executive director for Democracy Watch News in Seattle. Um, rock and roll city, as people called it when I was in Paris. Uh, it's, it's always nice being in Seattle if you like music because it has such a gre- great reputation uh, for music, especially rock and roll. But, of course, other cities like Austin, Texas, Nashville, uh, Tennessee, uh, Los Angeles, New York City, Chicago for blues, New Orleans are also really great places to be if you love music because you're constantly surrounded by it and you're constantly inspired by other players and other musicians and that's a good place to be as a musician is to be uh, have, a, have a regional support network and also have other musicians in your region that uh, you admire so go out there and listen to some music and keep rocking folks this is Mark Taylor Canfield and that's where the music business is today been listening to democracy cast from democracy watch news democracy cast is available wherever you access your podcasts you can also hear it at tune in radio you can follow democracy watch news at facebook and subscribe to our international news feeds at twitter check out the website where you'll find links to our podcasts and blogs democracywatchnews.org Special thanks to Steve Barnes, Sally Gellert, and John Harvey for technical assistance. The Democracy Cast theme was composed by Mark Taylor Canfield. Thanks for listening.